Okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. We've got 64 people uh, signed up, uh, that's, sorry, uh, in attendance, but that's, we have a lot more registered. So um, hopefully more will just um, continue to sign on, uh, log in as we, as we go. I will begin with the introductions and a little bit of brief information overview before we start with our main speakers. So I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations who are the traditional owners of this land that this webinar is broadcast on. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and I'd definitely like to acknowledge our, or all of these uh, people uh, and groups and certainly our speakers, Dr. David Smulovic, uh, Nicola Baker and Arimbi Winoto, and I'll tell you more about them as we go along. I'd also like to thank the Northwestern Melbourne PHN or Primary Healthcare Network for partnering with us to provide uh, this GP education. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, you will notice that you all have your camera and microphones turned off. So in order to ask questions, please type them into the question section. So if you look at the GoToWebinar control panel, which is on the right hand side for me, um, there's little arrows and headings and one of them is questions. If you click on the triangle, it'll open up that box and you can type questions in there. Um, I will be moderating those questions as we go along. Um, if you have any technical questions or difficulties, could you please type those in the chat section? So different to the clinical questions as Madeline Leonard from Northwest Melbourne PHN uh, is supporting us and monitoring those, quest uh, those um, things to assist you. We are video recording this uh, event and the video recording will be made available online. I will email when it is available and we'll create a link from the hospital GP education webpage um, for you to have a look at. There's other recordings there if you want to have a look at some of our past uh, events. Evaluation forms will be emailed to you at the close of this webinar um, by Madeline. Please complete them as soon as possible. If you're like me, if you you know plan to do it later, it'll, it won't happen. Uh, we use that feedback to plan future events. I, I think it's necessary for us to collect that data to get the RACGP points for you, um, and we do really value your feedback. Okay, so I'll just briefly introduce a few things today, show you our website and referral guidelines, and very briefly mention health pathways, um, and then the main feature presentation will, will commence and take up the bulk of uh, the presentation. So this is the INA Hospital website, just a screenshot of it. Um, go to, if, if you just Google Ione Hospital, it'll be one of the first ones that come up. Um, you click on the Health Professionals button and then for GPs to get to this screen. There's some information on that screen. I'll just scroll down um, about the effects that COVID-19 pandemic is having on the hospital and, and they'll be updated as appropriate. So if you've got any questions, have a look at the website about that. Um, there's also, I'm just scrolling down to the bottom of the page, um, a link to any of the hospital's response to COVID-19. Okay, and then we click to the page on referral guidelines. We have um, referral guidelines. If you're looking for referral guidelines to the Balance Disorders and Ataxia Service, which is um, to our team who's presenting tonight. And certainly if you want to refer patients with vertigo, have a look there on what the referral requirements are. They'll be under the ENT referral guidelines. Um, our speakers will mention also the process for referring as it is a Medicare funded clinic. We, we do require, have certain special requirements for those referrals. I am not going to dwell on this very much, but I just do want to mention statewide referral criteria. So they are in existence. They exist for this condition, dizziness or vertigo, 
um, and, and cover ENT and, and many other specialties. Um, all Victorian hospitals are obliged to um, triage referrals based on these criteria. So that means we also are required to do that. Um, those criteria have been built into our referral guidelines and also um, into um, health pathways. So wherever you are in Victoria, these apply to you if you are um, referring a patient to a Victorian public hospital. Um, the Melbourne health pathways apply to the majority of metropolitan Melbourne. Um, if you live outside that area, there will be health pathways that apply to you. Essentially, the clinical and referral information or criteria will be very, very similar and will include the statewide referral criteria, um, but as to where to refer may vary slightly from region to region. So if you don't already use health pathways or, or, and want to know how to get access, then I suggest that you contact your local PHN uh, or you can visit that website there and these um, slides will be sent around as handouts so you can access that information later. That's the Melbourne Health Pathways. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce our first speaker, <laughs> Dr. David Milovich. David's laughing. Why are you laughing? It's a picture of you. <laughs> That's just to remind me that it's you. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Smilovic. He's an Australian neurologist, neuro otologist and medical researcher. He's the head of our Balance Disorders and Ataxia Service at the Royal Victorian INE Hospital and is founder of the Alfred Hospital Cerebella Ataxia Clinic. Honorary consultant neurologist at St. Vincent's Hospital and lecturer at Melbourne University. David is a lead investigator on research defining a novel ataxia, cerebellar ataxia with neuropathy and vestibular areflexia syndrome, and a, a project to develop instrumented objective ataxia metrics, as well as the development of an objective ocular motor test of imbalance. The video, VVOR, which I'm loving that name, the VVOR. <laughs> um, David has done this, um, this talk for us a couple of times. It's still the most popular video recorded um, presentation that we have on our website. I, I know I still struggle and many GPs struggle with this topic and David um, definitely helps to make a very seemingly complex topic quite simple. So I really appreciate you speaking for us today. Thank you, take it away. Okay, thanks Lena. Now. Where are my slides? There they are. Can everyone hear me and see my slide? Yes. Yep, okay, good. Well, Lena, thanks for the um, intro and um, all the uh, pressure there. So I'm gonna talk about um, a clinical approach to the busy patient. Um, and um, I've just started my time there, so hopefully I stick to time. Um, I'm very happy to be um, interrupted and saved from myself for any questions or comments. Alrighty, so let's, now, why, oh, my slide isn't advancing, hang on a sec. Phone B, there we go. All right, so just first off, a little bit about our service. Um, so it's a multidisciplinary service. We've got different doctors and different allied health clinicians. So we've got neurologists, we've got an otologist, so a specialist ear ENT surgeon. We've got trainees from ENT neurology and emergency. We've got Australia's largest group of vestibular audiologists um, who do all the testing. We've got an Omniac positioning system, which I think I've got a photo of later and we'll talk a little bit about. Um, we've got a vestibular physiotherapist who's going to talk to you soon. That's the RIMBY, um, speech pathologist, social worker, etc. Now, I don't know why, but I was told to include referral information, and I swear I put it on this slide yesterday, and it's not here. So I'm going to get in a lot of trouble later. Um, no. But there will be, at the end, information on how to um, refer to us. But I think the main message is, um, if you're going to refer to us, just 
just refer into the clinic. There's no need to choose whether you want the medical clinic, the audiologist, the Omniax will we'll organise all that if that's what you want. Um, okay, so on our website, we have a patient portal and we did this because Dr. Google is such a terrible doctor and we were so sick of hearing um, about uh, patients' concerns. So you can, if you like, direct your patients here um, and there's information on um, balance disorders, balance testing, and um, it was written by a um, person who knows how to translate medical into English. Okay, so just a couple of things to get out of the way. The first one is that um, there seems to be some confusion and we, we sort of have patients coming in who say, oh, can you look in my ear and tell me um, if I've got an infection and that's why I'm dizzy, um, do I need antibiotics, etc." And the, the thing that we sort of have to explain to people um, is that the balance mechanism sits in the inner ear. So it's not visible um, from the outside, not with an ophthalmoscope or otherwise. Um, and it's not remediable to antibiotics. And it's not caused by um, common um, viral infections. We will, we will talk about the one specific case and it's usually fairly obvious. So otitis externa, otitis media do not call this, cause dizziness. I've made the second point, so I'm gonna keep moving. All right, so in terms of a toolbox for dizzy patients, um, I think the first thing is, as always, a good history, but it doesn't need to be a long history. Um, from my point of view, the main targeted questions are, um, can the patient define their dizziness? One, two, is it constant or is it episodic? Now, as you'll see, soon see most causes of dizziness are episodic, but a lot of patients tell us that it's constant. And I think mostly they're lying. And I think the reason for that is that they mix up all the awfulness. So what I do is if a patient says to me it's constant, when I ask, I say, is it that you're spinning all the time or is it that you're spinning periodically and in between you just feel awful? And they usually answer the latter. Now the importance of that question will become obvious, I hope, in a couple of moments. Um, the other question is um, what triggers vertigo? And the most important um, dichotomy here is really motion induced versus spontaneous. Can you sit in a chair doing nothing and your dizziness attacks you? Watching TV is not spontaneous because that can sometimes be a strong visual trigger or is it when you move? Now, patients will often say I'm moving my body, but it's their head that moves. So I might ask them, do you go to cross the road, look left and right, and all of a sudden you're feeling woozy and don't know where you are? So that's motion induced. Um, and that reason for that will also become um, obvious. All right, in terms of the examination, it's really just a screening neurological examination. It's nothing fancy. I know neurologists love to scare other doctors into thinking they need to do a four hour examination, but that's not at all necessary. <laughs> the, the only two um, particular bedside tests that I would suggest is one, a whole pipe maneuver, and we'll, I'll speak very briefly about that in a review, we'll go through that in more detail. And the other one is a head impulse test, which will also be covered. Um, occasionally we do an audiogram, and here, particularly if we're thinking of many years, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and the time when an audiogram is really important is if there's sudden onset, severe dizziness and hearing loss, um, where um, corticosteroids may be helpful for um, a sudden hearing loss. And the last point is that brain imaging is not often required. 
Um, and quite simply, this is because the standard imaging that's ordered is a non-contrast CT brain. The part of the brain that we would be concerned about, if we were concerned, and I'll explain to you that most of the time we, we don't need to be concerned, um, is the posterior fossa, which is really poorly visualised by a non-contrast CT brain. So the important consideration here is that our patients will have isolated vertigo. They are not presenting with vertigo and other central signs because then they don't belong here. They belong with the stroke workup. And I will talk about that briefly. But the point is these are not patients who sit down in your offices and say, I'm vertiginous and my speech has gone off and I'm drooling. Um, I'm being a bit silly, but I think what happens is that there's a confusion that we need to exclude a stroke in every vertiginous patient, but we don't. So where we're talking about isolated vertigo and no other CNS red flag, the CT brain won't be very helpful because what can a CT brain visualise? So it can visualise a fresh, fresh bleed in the posterior fossa, but that's not going to give us isolated vertigo. It can visualise a large mass, but again, that's not going to give us isolated vertigo. Both of those conditions would give us vertigo plus a range of other CNS abnormalities. The imaging modality of choice is an MRI brain, but we will see that that's not very often required. All right, very basic bit of physiology. So our chap on the left is physiology man. And what's happening here is that he's turning his head to his right, that's a large arrow on top. The end organs, here particularly the semicircular canals, three per ear, arranged orthogonally so they can sense radial movement in any plane, constantly chatter. So they constantly have an output. And this is called vestibular tone or vestibular tonus. So this is unusual. The sensory organs that are never quiet. So it's not the fact that they're on or off. What is important is the relative difference. So when our man here turns to the right, he excites the ear, which he's turning towards, which is his right ear. And so the afferent firing rate, the chatter of his right ear increases, the chatter of his left ear decreases. So the ears are saying the head's going to the right. Now, although we deny this, it's really mostly about vision because it's important that we are able to acquire and maintain a stable image of our visual world. So moving our head to the right activates a reflex called the VOR, the vestibulo-oscular reflex, which very simply drives the eyes an equal amount in the opposite direction so that our visual world stays stable. Okie doke. And so that's what you can see with the arrows on the forehead. Head goes to the right, eyes flick to the left and then slowly come back. And that's normal. All right, so let's look at pathological man on the right. So he's got a problem with his left ear. And although it's a flat line there, in reality it's not. It's just the reduced firing rate. So it's exactly the same as the diagram on the left. The only difference is that he's not moving his head. So what's happening here really is that the vestibular output is the same as if the patient was moving their head away from the affected side. So it activates the VOR, which flicks the eyes to the left, but because the head's still looking straight away, the visual world is flicked to the left, and then the eyes move back into the center and then flick again, and that's what drives the vertigo. That's why people's world spin when they have a vestibulopathy. All right, so the eyes have it. 
Um, and here what we're going to see is an abnormal eye movement. So this is nystagmus. It's got a quick phase and a slow phase. The quick phase is the phase that grabs our attention. And I can't grill you, can I? But what I usually suggest is that people ask themselves when they look at eye signs, which are much easier than you'd think if anyone had bothered to teach you them in medical school, is there an abnormality? Question one. Yes, of course. Which plane is it in? Now, there are only three planes. It can be in the horizontal plane, the vertical plane, or the torsional or rotational plane. So this is in the horizontal plane, and the fast phase is moving to the right, and so that is right feeding nystagmus. And I urge you to start looking at dizzy people's eyes because you will find a whole world starts to pop out at you once your eyes get used to seeing them. So that's right feeding nystagmus. And that's what happens when you have a unilateral vestibulopathy, which we saw in our cartoons on the last slide. Now, what happens when you have a bilateral vestibulopathy, so neither inner ear mechanism is working well? And so, as your head moves, there is no dampening mechanism and your eyes move as well. And that's called oscillopsia. And so, when I'm asking patients about that, what I'll ask you, when you're walking, can you read a sign in a shop window? If you're traveling in a car, can you read a street sign? Or do you have to wait until you stop? And that's David, should those patients here. actually be driving? No, David, should those patients actually, those patients be, driving? Not be driving? That's an excellent question. They don't usually ask that question. Um, <laughs> but um, depending on which state you're in, they may not be able to or shouldn't. Um, and that's and there's a whole another story with yeah. that, but um, certainly Vic Roads have some criteria for um, for uh, dizziness and driving. All right, so look, vertigo is all these things, but most of the time it's spinning. Um, now, I think the problem with um, diagnosing vertiginous patients is that we tend to be taught this in practical way, which is we go into a room, we're supposed to have a very long list of peripheral and central causes and somehow decide which side of the table the patient is on, the peripheral or the central, and then narrow down one of 50 differential diagnoses, which I don't think is at all helpful. Um, so I'm going to try and take you through something that I think is a bit easier. But if you want to know what per peripheral and what central is, here it is. So peripheral is the end organs, so the three semicircular canals and the two otolith organs, um, the vestibular nerve and the root entry zone, so where it enters the brainstem, and then central is from there on in, into the brainstem and up. All right, so let's move on. So quickly, this, is, this comes back to my comment about isolated vertigo. So these are the things we worry about. And I'm, I'm going through these really just to make the point um, that it's not that complicated and that you are not going to miss these things. So the first point, if your patient is dysarthric and drooling, you're not going to tell them that it's peripheral and go home. So your three minute neurological examination which after tonight will have the addition of a head impulse test and a whole pipe manoeuvre, is not going to let you down here. The second point is that if they have a collection of central signs, so they're ataxic, their gait is broad based, they have a lot of funky eye movement, and you think to yourself, gosh, you must be really, really unsteady. Um, and you ask them and they say, oh yeah, you know, I am feeling imbalanced, but they're not telling you some tragedy, then that's a red flag because the concern is that this is a central progressive condition and they're adapting along the way. 
which is very different to the acute situation, either centrally, for example, with a cerebellar stroke, or peripherally with vestibular neuritis, which we'll talk about, where patients will have florid signs, but will also subjectively tell you that they feel awful and try and vomit on you. All right, third point. So when you look at their eyes, and when you get them to follow your finger to the left, their eyes beat to the left. And when you get their, them to follow your finger to the right, their eyes beat to the right. That's direction changing nystagmus. I hope that I'll have a video that'll work. And that's another red flag. Pure vertical nystagmus, so either upbeat or downbeat, is a red flag. And any other eye movement abnormalities. Again, if one eye is moving normally from left to right, and the other one only moves to the neutral position, staring straight ahead, you're not gonna say that's normal. So this is really just a way of saying relax. The central stuff is very easily identified, despite what others might tell you. All right, so, okay. This video is not working. Can you give me one moment and I'm going to see if I can sort that out. Despite how much preparation we do, the videos often do not great. I certainly think I'm going to have to start looking at people's eyes a lot more. Um, I, I suspect that uh, you, you're seeing the segments in everybody that uh, I'm thinking they're just something stuck in their eye and they're blinking and <laughs> moving their eye around. All right, this, this, this video is not, not helping us. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so if I keep moving along, come on. Can do it. All right. Um, two. If you roll your mouse over that, does it? No, it doesn't do anything. Okay. No. What I'm going to do, because I think I've still got some time. Let's see if I can get up. It's just gone seven o'clock, David. So I've got that I'm in 20 minutes. That I've got, sorry, 20 minutes. Is that right? Uh, I can't remember. Is it 15? I think it's 15 to 20. Because we wanted to save a little bit extra time for our MD at the end. Happy to share my screen if necessary. I've got David's slides. Okay, so um, let me just, so the trick will be, Can you see this yes. eye that I've just put up? Yes? Yes, can see it. Okay. Yes. So is it moving now? Mm -hmm. Yep. A little bit. Okay, give me one sec. Okay, can you see that? Yes. So that's downbeat nystagmus. And that's the most common central nystagmus that we see. All right, I'm gonna keep moving. All right, so I think 
one of the important things to say is that there are a few diagnoses that seem to have overstayed their welcome, and this is one of them. So this idea that your patient presents with vertigo and it's a vertebra basal or TIA, um, still seems to be bandied around. There's a couple of problems with it. The first one is, is the one about isolated vertigo. So where in the brain could we transiently or otherwise occlude blood and get isolated vertigo? So the issue is pretty much nowhere um, because there are about 16 vertigo centers. So that doesn't work. The next thing is, what's the likelihood of getting a TIA that recurs many, many times and doesn't really alter? So that's also very unlikely because TIAs generally change, crescendo, disappear, end up in a stroke. And the story that I remember being taught at med school was the old guy who's backing out of the Gerard turns around and he's got cervical degenerative bone disease with some osteophytic lipping and he kinks the vertebral artery every time. I mean, the reality is that this is almost always going to be peripheral vestibular and not um, TIAs. So again, um, if they're giving you a story of vertigo double vision and slurred speech, that's very different, but not um, five episodes of isolated vertigo, nausea, maybe some vomiting. All right, next. Okay, so um, the cast. So the most common cause of episodic vertigo, vertigo is BCTV. Second most common cause, migranous vertigo. Vestibular neuritis, we'll talk about that. This is a viral cause, but not the soria virus. Many airs disease, often diagnosed, but at least 10 times less common than vestibular migraine. MS, always in these lists, but the reality is in large series that have been done, isolated, again, that word is important, causes of vertigo in patients with MS are peripheral. So again, it's around where could a plaque be and give you isolated vertigo. All right, there's my point. So these are the patients who come in and have acute onset, severe, constant, so that word is important, vertigo. Their gait will be broad-based, they'll be nauseous, and they'll probably try and vomit on you. They will, in probability, have vestibular neuritis, but we want to exclude a posterior fossa stroke. All right, so vestibular neuritis. So this is a viral infection that causes significant damage to the end organs and or nerve. It generally comes on suddenly, will last at least 24 hours, start to slowly improve. The nystagmus in these patients will be florid and it will be the typical nystagmus of a peripheral vestibular lesion. So it will be away from the affected side, it may have a small torsional component. It won't be direction changing. Okay, so the important thing is that it's unilateral. When you do a head impulse test, you'll be learning about that. That will be strongly abnormal. So the combination of those two will essentially rule out a stroke and give you your diagnosis. Treatment in the first 48 to 72 hours is short course of high dose oral steroids. 
vestibular suppressants and anti-nauseates should only be used very short term because there is some evidence to suggest that they may interfere with central compensation. And this is the mainstay of recovery because the peripheral apparatus generally does not significantly recover. And the only evidence-based treatment for this is vestibular physiotherapy. 20 to 25 percent of patients will go on to develop BPPV, and this is thought to be because of the significant end organ damage, and that there is liberation of the small crystals in the ear or otoconia which cause BPPV. And there'll be more about that later. So, Sorry, David, would you, could I interrupt you just for you to just briefly talk about uh, GP prescribing steroids, oral steroids for this condition? Should yeah, we be doing so that? Look, yeah, straight away, please. Prednisolone, 50 milligrams for five days, no need to wean. Um, there's, a, there's a reasonably good evidence base to show that it will improve recovery. So straight into and it, please. Does, does it reduce the chances of going on to have BPPV? Not that we know of. Okay. We, sorry, I should answer that differently. The trials haven't been done, as far as I'm aware. We don't know whether it's done or doesn't. We don't have evidence. Yep. Um, yep. But look, the truth is BPPV in and of itself isn't the worst thing. The worst thing is poor compensation and these patients end up um, on a disability support pension because they don't compensate um, adequately. No one ever sends them to a vestibular physiotherapist and it's terrible. Um, most patients will recover um, to some extent. Some will recover on their own, but you know, my general rule of thumb, um, and it'll be interesting to hear what Arimbi says, is that if within two weeks they're not significantly better, then I send them off to a vestibular physio. Yeah. Alrighty, so the eye movements for this, remember, are unilateral, beating away from the affected side. So you can see that. And a little trick is when they look into the direction of the nystagmus, which they've just done now, the nystagmus gets very big. But I think the most important thing, given the time frame here, is that it's unilateral, beating away from the affected side. Um, all right, posterior fossa stroke, just quickly. They will have other central signs, cerebellar dysarthria, upper limb ataxia. The head impulse test will be normal because the ear is normal, the brain is the problem. The nystagmus will be direction changing. It may well also be vertical. Remember pure upbeat, pure downbeat. MRI brain is the definitive diagnostic modality. However, in the first 48 hours, the combination of a normal head impulse test, direction changing nystagmus, and skewed deviation is more accurate than an MRI. Now, the third one is the most difficult one, but thankfully it's also the least important. So once you've learnt to do a head impulse test and you've trained your eyes to look at nystagmus, you can be more accurate than an MRI in the first two days. And this saves a lot of patients from unnecessary CT and increase of thyroid cancer risk. All right, so number two, recurrent vertigo. And the, this is the bulk of our patients. So these patients on probability will have vestibular migraine, one, number two, many years disease. So vestibular migraine. Now, the diagnosis of migraine is really tough because there, there is no um, objective investigative modality. So it's often a matter of excluding the things that we can and piecing together a history. So these patients will often have a past history of classic migraine. They may have headaches symptoms, but these may be separated in time from the vertigo, at least 30% of the time. They may also complain of tinnitus and subjective hearing loss. So the overlap with many ears is significant. And I'll often ask 
patients for a family history, particularly on the maternal side, past history, whether they've ever had any visual symptoms in the past, because patients tend to remember the weird and wonderful flashing lights that they may have seen. And sometimes just trial um, a course of migraine preventers. Now, many years, which is at least 10 times less common, in theory has a predominance of oral symptoms. So oral fullness, tinnitus, hearing loss, prior to the onset of vertigo. Even then, it can be really difficult to distinguish um, from migraine. Now, there's a test called an ECOG, which is not particularly helpful very often without going into detail. And often small private labs will come back and say the patient's got many years. But that, that, most of the time that's not the case. So we have to be careful. And Nicola will talk more about this, but I think what is helpful is audiograms, particularly serial audiograms, which show fluctuation in the low and middle frequencies. And that's very convincing of many years. Now, all the treatments for many years, so beta histine, thiazide diuretic, sodium restriction, they all have extremely poor evidence base. And there was a Cochrane review done a year or two ago that showed that they're all really ordinary. Um, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that um, there's probably a placebo effect in some people. The third thing to say is that there's some evidence coming out of Germany to suggest that beta histine or CERC in high dose does help a subset of patients. And this may be because we're not really that good at carving up either many years or migraine into what are probably a number of different conditions. So we do sometimes try quite high doses of beta histine. Okie doke. I'm gonna keep moving. So motion induced or positional nystagmus, sorry, dizziness. So this is the third category. And these are the patients who come in and they can't get their dizziness when they're, um, when they're sitting on the chair doing nothing, but they can get it when they're moving their head, going across the road, looking up and down, lying back in bed, rolling over in bed. So the first thing to talk about is a poorly compensated peripheral lesion. Let's take our poor guy who had vestibular neuritis. And it's two weeks later and he's still all over the shop. He looks pale, he can't walk in a straight line, he doesn't know when he can go back to bed to work. Um, and so treatment for him is tough love on the medication because we are concerned about interfering with central compensation and prompt referral to a vestibular physiotherapist. And Arimbi will talk about that. BPPV, the most common cause of vertigo. Now, there are a few important things to say about this. First of all, um, the underlying pathology is the odoconia, the small calcium carbonate crystals, which are part of the vestibular apparatus, become loose, enter the semicircular canal, alter the hydrodynamics, cause a positional dizziness. Now, I want to list to you, for you how you cannot make a diagnosis of BPPV. So you can't make a diagnosis of BPPV across the desk. Even if the patient gives you a great story for BPPV, that's not adequate. Number two, you can't make a diagnosis of BPPV by doing a hall pike and the patient says, doctor, that's my dizziness. Number three, you can't make a diagnosis of BPPV by doing a hall pike and seeing some nystagmus. The only way you can make a diagnosis of BPPV is by doing a hall pike and seeing the characteristic nystagmus. So the reasons for going through my bugbears are that um, one, there are other conditions that can give you positional nystagmus. 
So that's the diagnosis across the desk. Two, there are other conditions that can make patients feel vertiginous when they do a hall pipe. Three, there are other conditions that can give people abnormal nystagmus when you do a hall pipe. They include central positioning nystagmus, and a subset of those have a structural cause. So we have, I think now, half a dozen patients who have gone off to the neurosurgeons after having been treated for BPTV because they do have symptoms in the hall park. They do have nystagmus, but it's central, not peripheral. So um, I think Arimbi's going to go through in detail with you the nystagmus, but it's characteristic and it's the posterior canal which causes 80 to 90% of BPPV. And I'm just going to show you a very quick video. And so what happens is the patient gets laid back in the, in the hall pipe position, nothing happens. You get this torsional upbeat, which you can see, and it should start picking up. Looks like it's moving slowly and the videos are an epic fail. So let's wait for a rendi. Oh, let's have another go. All right, so look, I've been through um, presentations. Yep, so I've been through acute onset severe constant, vestibular neuritis. We can exclude a posterior fossa stroke with our examination, particularly once we learn how to do the head impulse test. And we're used to looking at nystagmus and the direction changing nystagmus. Uh, I, I'm sorry about the videos, but if you email Lena or myself, I'll happily send you links to the video. Otherwise, um, YouTube has good videos. David, All is right. there link? David, if they're links, um, we can send them out with the handouts if you include them to, if you send them to Marilyn. Right. Okay. Number two is recurrent or episodic vertigo. And on probability, that's going to be vestibular migraine. And we're going to hunt around for the jigsaw puzzles on history for vestibular migraine, understanding that it doesn't always have the accompanying headache component um, and where there's particular emphasis on oral symptoms we'll wonder about many years and we'll talk more about the role of audiology there the third presentation is motion induced or positional with BPPV as being our most common cause, presenting with the classic rolling over in bed or what was called the top shelf vertigo, looking up or looking down. And Wendy's gonna teach you the very satisfying feeling of being able to cure something in your room. And poorly compensated peripheral lesion, which generally follows a vestibular insult such as vestibular neuritis. And they will have motion induced dizziness and they're off to the physios. All right, I'll be quiet now. Thanks, David. Oh, yes, sorry, my turn. I will just uh, very briefly, um, in the interest of time, so um, there haven't been many questions except for demonstration of head impulse test and whole pipe, but I've, I know everyone is going to be presenting those. Um, if there's any other questions, maybe we'll leave them to the end. Um, I, I just will make a comment about um, in your, your rules about uh, diagnosing BPPV. Um, and I've certainly listened to your presentation before and am aware of that. And I would 
say I can't see this segment because I am really struggling to prove that people have BPPV, so I end up sending them next door to the vestibular physio so he can do so. Um, and yep. on that note, Arimbi's actually sent me a list of um, vestibular physios in and around Melbourne and Victoria, and I have yet not been able to get that put up on our website. I will try to include it in the handout for this presentation and I'll keep working on getting it put up on our website, perhaps under the clinical resources, because um, I'm having trouble with the primary care guidelines. So, um, but I'll make sure they're attached to the handout for, for uh, attendees of this presentation. Okay, let me uh, introduce our, our next speaker, um, Nicola Baker. So it's my pleasure to introduce Nicola. Uh, she's been working in diagnostic audiology for many years with experience at various hearing and balance clinics both around Australia and in the UK. She's currently the senior audiologist for the general audiology speech and balance services at the INE Hospital. Thanks, Nicola. Thanks, Lena, and thanks for having me today. Um, my job today is to give you a little bit more information about how audiology fits into the multidisciplinary um, team and the BDAS clinic. Um, the audiologists at the INE not only support the, the BDAS clinic, we also support our ENT and cochlear implant clinics as well. Um, but today we're going to be talking about vestibular testing, um, what that testing involves and what diagnostic information is available from the testing. So here's our scope. Um, we assess the hearing system, peripheral vestibular function, and during the testing we can also note any clinical signs of central pathology so that we can make recommendations for potentially further investigations um, by the medical team. We have a whole list of different tools that we can use. Um, we obviously don't use all of these things with every patient. Our aim is to arrive at the most appropriate test battery um, and set of results for the particular patient. Um, and one of the things that we use to help us decide which tests is a detailed history. Um, David touched on this before, that history is a very important tool for the medical team. Um, also for our diagnostic assessment, it is really important. Um, so it can give you a um, most likely diagnosis um, just by talking to the patient or a working hypothesis that you're um, thinking may be a possibility as you go through the testing. But it also informs our clinical decision making. Um, so which tests we're going to do and perhaps also in which order we might do them in. Our history tends to um, encompass all of these things, so presenting concern of the patient, their story of history, um, ENT and hearing health, any migraine history, and also other considerations or contraindications to some of our testing regimes. I thought I'd um, pause on the hearing test first. Um, it can hold a lot of important information, so it's good to be aware of um, what an audiogram looks like, um, it's basically a test of behavioural hearing thresholds, so the very softest level that somebody can hear at different frequencies. So it allows us to determine the degree and type of hearing loss and which frequencies are involved. So on the audiogram, across the top we have the frequencies tested. Um, they're the low, mid and high frequency range across the top there. And down the vertical axis we have the degree of hearing loss. So if the person has normal hearing, you'll see all of the marks on the audiogram right at the top of the graph. And as you progressively go down, we go through the mild, moderate, severe and profound range of hearing. The first thing we do in a hearing test is we look at the air conduction thresholds. Now, um, when we present sound to the ear, um, we either use headphones or insert phones or tube phones, which are like, just like a little plug into the ear. The, as the name suggests, um, the sound has to travel through the air to get through um, the whole ear system. So the sound wave enters the ear canal, vibrates the eardrum, moves through the middle ear system and into the cochlea. Um, once that's stimulated, the person hears the sound and um, presses the button for us to know whether, whether they hear it or not. So when we're doing air conduction thresholds, we mark on the audiogram for the left side with a blue cross for each particular sound and for the right side with a red circle. Um, we also test with bone conduction um, and that obviously um, transmits the sound through the bone. So this little um, headset you can see in the bottom actually sits on behind the mastoid um, bone on the mastoid bone and what happens here is that the sound directly goes through the bone to the cochlea so it bypasses all of the middle ear system and the outer ear and so what we can do there is we can actually localize where the hearing loss is in the ear by looking at the difference between the bone and the air conduction thresholds 
When we test with brain conduction, we mark with a little arrow or a bracket. Blue again is left and red is the right side. So when we're localising hearing loss in the ear, um, if we can localise to the outer or the middle ear, this is what we call a conductive hearing loss. And if we're localising it to the inner ear, we call that a sensory neural hearing loss, being a sensory organ or neural on the nerve pathway. So I'm going to go through a few examples of what this looks like on the audiogram. The first is our sensory neural hearing loss example. So here you can see that the um, threshold levels that are measured for each particular sound measured with air conduction and bone conduction are quite similar. Um, they're also outside the normal range, which I've got up the top of the graph just for reference. Um, so sound is passing through the middle ear quite well here, but the hearing loss is located in the cochlea or further in. So that's a sensory neural hearing loss. Um, you'll typically see this with presbycusis or um, hearing loss as you age. By comparison, a conductive hearing loss, the left side here in blue is the abnormal side. You can see the brackets up the top of the graph um, in blue within the normal range. So that suggests to us that the bone conduction hearing is good. But when we present the sound through the air, through the headphone or tube phone, you can see that the crosses are further down the graph. So what's happening here is that there's something within the middle part of the ear that's stopping the sound from getting through. So this type of hearing, uh, type of audiogram you would see with um, middle ear pathology, so maybe fluid behind the eardrum. You can also have a little bit of both. So this is a mixed hearing loss. Um, both the air conduction and the bone conduction thresholds are outside of the normal range, but they're not the same as each other. So there's a little bit coming uh, of the hearing loss coming from the cochlea and there's a little bit coming from the middle ear. So I wanted to run you through those because it's very important to, um, they can give you diagnostic clues depending on the type of hearing loss that's there for the dizzy patient. So why do you want to test the hearing for dizzy people? There are conditions which affect both the hearing and the balance systems and David's touched on many as disease and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, acoustic neuroma is another one. There's also audiological findings that can provide clues on pathology. Here an example might be a dehiscence of the semicircular canal um, and that provides a really characteristic pattern of results on the audiogram and might prompt you to then move on to CT so that you can um, confirm that diagnosis. We also might pick up issues impacting on the overall well-being of the patient. So things like other ENT comorbidities that might require treatment or surgery, um, or an undiagnosed hearing loss that might require amplification. So, Meniere's disease. Um, as David uh, touched on, and as most of you probably know, Meniere's disease presents as episodic vertigo with an element of hearing loss and tinnitus. It's typically a low frequency hearing loss. Um, so I've put two audiograms up here, which both show a low frequency hearing loss, the left side being the abnormal side again. Um, the one on the right hand side has a conductive hearing loss and we know that because the um, bone conduction thresholds are up the top of the graph within the normal range, whereas the air conduction thresholds are further down the graph. The one on the opposite side, oh sorry, I've gone around the wrong way. So the first one was the sensory neural one on the left. The one on the right hand side is the, is the conductive hearing loss. Um, so the, my main point here is that the bone conduction thresholds is what you need to look at. Um, if it's a conductive hearing loss, such as the one on the right, um, this is not consistent with Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease needs to have a sensory neural hearing loss in the mid to low frequencies, typically has unilateral tinnitus, um, and also both of these things are usually temporally correlated with their vertiginous symptoms. So they have a big episode of, of quite severe vertigo, roaring tinnitus, and the, and the hearing loss is, is noticeable as well during that time. And as David also talked about, this recovers somewhat after the episode is over. So if you do suspect many as disease, documentation of this hearing loss is really important, um, particularly, like David said, over time, if you can um, track it over time and if you can catch it within or close to a vertiginous episode um, and also show that recovery intuitively, that's really great. Sorry, Nicola, I'm just going to interrupt. There was a question, yeah. um, but it might have been for David, but can you say more about the fluctuation of low and middle hearing with um, I presume it was um, with many ears, with many ears as a typo. Yeah, yeah. Are so you saying um, or should we leave that for David? Uh, we can, well, David, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. He's on his phone, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, 
if if you have um, a patient who has many disease, like I said, this is a sort of a textbook example that we've got on the left hand side of this graph here. But what you typically see is they might have normal hearing in between each episode. Um, when the episode has is just before the episode happens and just after, they'll have a dip, like you might see on this graph, and then it recovers. But some over time, what happens is it doesn't actually recover right up into the normal range. So you'll have this progressive sort of pattern of hearing loss over time and it, it, you can actually get to the point where um, they, they say it burns out so that the is actually takes away all of the hearing um, within that range and it can actually inf infiltrate into the higher frequencies as well. Okay, great. I think, yeah, she feels it. Sorry, I couldn't get we'll, my we'll phone off that you. Ah, uh, okay, that's all right. Um, David, while we've got you, I, I, I know we're we're blowing our time out a little bit, but that uh, I think that question's been answered. But there is also a question around uh, that mentioning on what Nicola was talking about before, that as GPs we're constantly taught that if there is asymmetry in the hearing loss, we have to refer to ENT or do an MRI to exclude a neuroma. But I mm -hmm. pretty, this GP finds that she. She pretty much um, anyone who has an audiology over the age of 50 seems to have some degree of asymmetry. So is it yep. really necessary to refer all those people? Can, I can probably comment on that. There's a, a level of significance in the asymmetry that you need to look at. So you're right, there will be some degree of asymmetry. Um, each clinic has slightly different criteria, but for us, it needs to be a 30 dB difference between the bone conduction thresholds over three frequencies. Um, so if you see that, that's a red flag. It sometimes comes along with other symptoms such as unilateral tinnitus, obviously vertigo can be a part of that as well. So if you have um, just a very mild asymmetry that doesn't fit that criteria, you may not, that might not sort of prompt you to go straight to MRI. If you had that asymmetry along with other things as well that might be red flags, that's more of a, a compelling case to go to, to scanning. Yeah, so we can use our clinical judgment and based on the degree of... As long as you have quality, quality audiology results, um, then yes. Yeah. Can I just, Lena, yep. can I just make a comment? Please, yes. I mean, I think it's, it's sort of what Nick said, but I'll say it more seriously. I mean, really, the audiologist should be able to point out to you when the asymmetry is significant um, and that I'm, I'm looking for a polite way to say this that shouldn't be the defensive reason that should be because their methodology is calibrated and they can tell you it's significant or not so I think this is the value in having a, um, a good relationship with a, um, a um, an audiology um, mm. centre that's um, well set up and has um, the right protocols. Because otherwise, yeah, I think as doctors we are chasing our tails um, and referring and imaging a whole lot of patients unnecessarily. Great, thank you. And I, I think we've got a list go. of, uh, of audiologists out in the community that we might be able to circulate with our handouts as well. Is that right, Nicola? Um, I, I'm not sure, but we can we can certainly I, I, have a look at that. I'll get I'll get back to you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, there's the Audiological Society of Australia as well, which has a website which you can um, access information on audiologists and availability and that sort of thing as well. Thanks. Okay, I'll move on if that's okay. Um, yep. Uh, so I'm up to the balance testing now. Um, we have quite an extensive list of balance testing. Um, I'm just going to um, touch on the acronyms at the front of this list first of all. Um, David's already talked about the head impulse test. Um, we have a video version which we call the VHIT, so video head impulse test. Um, and also the VEMP testing which is a vestibular evoked myogenic potential. We have two versions of that, the C and the OVEMP, so cervical and ocular VEMP. So I'll go through those tests with you now, um, but I just wanted to um, say so that's how I'll refer to those tests at this, um, going forward from here. Okay, so here's our vestibule. Uh, our basic test battery for um, balance testing, we're trying to build a picture of how the function is across the five sensory parts of the labyrinth. So the five sensory parts being the semicircular canals, of which there are three, and the utricle and the saccule. So the semicircular canals are designed to detect angular motion, 
um, the testing that we can use to look at the function of those canals is the video head impulse test and that can test each canal individually. So you'll often hear um, the term six canal V hit and that just means that we're testing all six semicircular canals, three on each side. There's also a couple of tests which specifically look at the lateral or the horizontal canal. Um, these are the calorix and the rotational chair test. Um, not all clinics will have these, but um, at EONE we do use these routinely. Um, and they can give you a really in-depth look between the three of those tests at what the lateral canal is doing. There's also the oculus, which detect linear acceleration. So the utricle and the saccule. Um, the utricle detects backwards and forwards motion and the saccule detects up and down motion. So the tests that we use for those are the VEMP tests. So we have the C-VEMP, um, which tells us about the saccule fu function and the O-VEMP for the utricle function. Um, as David also has touched upon, we also test ocular motor function, um, which can give us information about the central pathways. So gaze testing, saccades to target and smooth pursuit um, tracking can give us some extra information. So the video head impulse test. Um, this is the, the same as the, as the bedside head impulse test, but it gives you some objective evidence of the functionality of that um, reflex gain that David was talking about, the VOR, vestibular ocular reflex. So you can see the patient seated, fixating on an earth fixed target. So they basically have a little um, target to look at in front of them. The head is moved swiftly in the horizontal plane whilst they fixate on the target. So what hap what's happening in this test is that the, the um, horizontal canal is detecting that horizontal motion that we're making with the head. It initiates that VOR pathway, which goes up through the brainstem and back down to the eye and allows that eye to, as the head moves to the right, for the eye to move left to remain on target. So in this way, we can test all of the six semicircular canals by moving the head in different ways um, and look if there's any dysfunction. I thought I'd give you a quick look at what this looks like visually with the graph that we get from the, from the software. Um, the system basically takes a measurement of the head velocity, so how quickly we move the head to the side versus the eye velocity, how quickly the eye reacts in the equal but opposite direction. And what happens here is that the software overlies the two things so that we can compare the two. Um, in this example, you can see some blue traces and the red traces. They represent the head movement. So the, the blue traces are a leftward head movement and the red is the rightward head movement. They're also overlaid with grey traces and that's the resultant eye movement. So this is where that software has matched them up to see whether there's a difference. In this normal example, you can see that there's not a difference. They match really well. Next one down is a unilateral vestibulopathy of the horizontal canal. On the left is the abnormal side here. And what you can see is that the grey tracing, instead of completely following where the blue trace goes, it cuts through the middle and then there's a shower of um, spikes on, um, at the, at the right-hand side of that trace. So what's happening here is as the head is being moved to the left, instead of the eyes automatically moving right, the, the eyes are staying with the head because the ear hasn't picked up that the, that the head's moving towards the left-hand side. A split second later, the eyes flick back towards the target and that's the catch-up saccade that we talk about and that's that shower of black spikes on the right-hand side of that graph. This is what a, a bilateral example of that looks like. So you can see a similar pattern on the right-hand side as well as the left. The caloric test is the next one. This is one of the oldest tests of vestibular function. Um, it involves applying a change of temperature to the outer ear canal and what we're hoping to do here is to, sti to stimulate the horizontal canal on each side. So here you need to think of the horizontal canal as a tube filled with fluid and as you can see by the diagram the patient is um, laid down supine with a 30 degree angle of the head raised and what that does is it puts the horizontal canal into the vertical plane. So you have a fluid filled canal sitting in the vertical plane. We then apply a thermal stimulus um, via the outer ear, through the ear canal, um, that temperature transfers through into the horizontal canal and creates a convection current which moves the fluid within that canal. Now what normally moves fluid in the horizontal canal is moving your head. So what this test is really doing is simulating movement of the head when the head is actually stationary. And that's quite important because it's often very difficult to actually um, isolate left side or right side and this test does it really nicely. Um, so it's a, a comparative test between the left side and the right side. It is based on the assumption that both the temperature on the right side and the left side will reach the inner part of the ear equally. So we have to remember that anything that might affect that temperature transferring through the outer and middle ear may affect the result. 
So things like middle air effusion or wax in the outer ear canal can really affect the result of a caloric. So um, this is one of the reasons why we often ask you to um, remove wax from patients who are having calorics. Okay, the next one is the rotational chair. Now this is the, the third test of the horizontal canal. So it's complementary to both the V-hit and the calorics that we've just talked about. As you can see in the picture, the patient is in a chair that rotates. Um, they're wearing infrared goggles. And the reason that is is because as the vestibular ocular reflex is initiated, creates that nystagmus that David was talking about before, and that's what we can um, record and measure using the goggles. So this provides information on how the horizontal canals are working together. Um, and as I said, is a complementary one to the other two. Now we're on to the vestibular evoked myogenic potential. So these are the ones that are looking at the otal function. The first one is the cervical. What we're doing here is stimulating the saccule, and we do that by um, click, uh, click stimulus through headphones. It's quite a loud click stimulus, and what that does is that it initiates the pathway from that saccule up through the brainstem and then back down to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. You may be able to see on the picture that we have an electrode placed over the belly of that muscle, um, and the patient is asked to raise their head. The raising of the head off the pillow contracts the, the SCM and we need that contraction because this is actually an inhibitory potential. So we, it's a momentary um, inhibition of the contraction of the muscle and we can measure that as you can see in the bottom trace as a potential. Again, this allows us to compare left side and right side, saccular function. This is the second VEMP test that we have, which is the ocular VEMP test. It's a similar sort of pattern. We're stimulating this time the utricle with vibration there's a black box that we're holding on the patient head there, and that's actually a tapping device, which produces a vibration through the skull, which um, stimulates the utricle, kicks off the pathway, again via the brainstem, but this time down to the ocular muscles. So it's the inferior oblique eye muscle that we're taking a recording from, and again, we can um, look at the left side versus the right side. So those tests that I've, I picked those tests in particular because that's the ones that we do for pretty much every patient. And you can see the reason why. It gives us a picture of the whole working of the vestibule and all of the five sensory parts. So that information along with the hearing test information and the history can really help the doctors to um, form a, an opinion about what the diagnosis may be. Um, we also do a few other um, adjunctive tests to that. I haven't got time to go into those today, um, but one of the most important ones is the positional assessment, which I know Rumbi's about to speak about now. Okay, great. Um, this is actually already been touched on, but I just, while I've got everybody's eyes, I did just want to talk about <laughs> the duration of hearing again. Um, it is time critical, which is the main point here. So if you do have a presentation of a person, um, usually unilateral sudden deterioration of hearing. If you have no clear evidence that there is a middle ear involvement or you're not sure, please get audiology done as soon as you can. And if you do see a sensory neural asymmetry, like we were talking about, that can be something that can be managed if it's um, looked at you know, soon. So um, refer directly to ENT or to our AD if you're local. Yeah, absolutely. And that's me. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you so much, Nicola. I'm I'm going to keep moving because we are way over time. I'm sorry, I knew this would happen to you, Rindy. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaky, speaker, Rindy Winoto. She's a physiotherapist with a background in neurology and falls prevention, and she works in vestibular rehabilitation in public and private services. She's been a vestibular physiotherapist for general audiology, speech and balance services at the Eye and Ear Hospital since 2007. Thanks, Rimby. Thank you. If you can see me, see the screen and hear me. Um, so, yeah, I think you'll be able to see your screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, absolutely. Yep, lovely. Um, I just do also want to acknowledge that the land that we meet and we work on today are the traditional lands of the Kulin nations. I'm just going to jump straight into benign positional vertigo because, as David was saying, this is probably the most common thing that we see. And everyone's been talking about a targeted history. And so really what you're listening out for here when questioning patients about vertigo is what do they mean by vertigo? Isn't it an illusion of movement? Is the room spinning? Do they feel that they're falling or see that they're falling? It's a, usually a spinning, a rotational move, 
uh, sensation and it usually lasts for 60 seconds or less, usually much less when you actually ask them about it. Um, and it's always triggered by a change in head position. So that's usually things like really common movements, rolling over in bed, getting in and out of bed, reaching up to prune a tree or up in the kitchen or in the supermarket shelf. Um, just a couple of other things is that it can be often worse in the morning and by the later in the day, sometimes people can sort of habituate to it so they don't feel it as much. Mm -hmm. Often again, David touched on this. Um, Often people will feel I'm constantly dizzy, I'm always dizzy. But if you try and sort out a little bit to what do they mean by that dizziness, the room spinning is how long does the actual spinning last for? And after that, are you feeling giddy or nauseous or imbalanced or are you getting that vertigo and illusion of movement for longer than that? With benign positional vertigo, it's usually less than a minute. It's always triggered by head position changes. So the cause, as David was saying, was these um, calcium carbonate crystals becoming dislodged from where they're supposed to sit in the otolith organs, usually the utricle, um, and they break away. Now, if you're just um, sitting still with your head not moving, they may have broken away, but they're not going to move anywhere. But it's when you move your head up or down um, that they're then going to move into the wrong place. And commonly, this is the posterior semicircular canal because that's the most gravity dependent. So this is a peripheral problem in the inner ear and it's mechanical, it's a biomechanical problem, not to do with nerves. In fact, it shows you that there's a little bit of intact nerve or you wouldn't be getting that sensation of vertigo. So the sorts of people that are particularly at risk, as David has said, um, people that have had some sort of inner ear um, issue in the past, often neuritis, about 20% of people will go on years later sometimes to um, develop benign positional vertigo. So they're the ones who, if you ask them, have you ever had anything like this before, they might say, oh, I had terrible vertigo that really lasted for hours and hours and it didn't matter what I did, and that gradually improved. This is nothing like that, it just happens in the morning and it's quite brief. Other sorts of people, people with head trauma, so they might have had a fall, they might have knocked their heads against something uh, and that's dislodged the crystals. Um, or they, and there's sometimes a hereditary component, so some people will say, yes, my mother had this, my, my um, father, my uncle had this any kind of disturbance really within the inner ear. And sometimes I hear this post-surgery and this can be head or ear surgery or it can be totally unrelated surgery. And we think it's because of this prolonged time lying completely still, often with their heads in odd, maybe dependent positions. The other people that commonly get this, people with osteoporosis or osteopenia and low vitamin D, um, people who are migraineurs often seem to be more at risk of getting benign position vertigo as well, also many years, but in a large number of cases, it's actually idiopathic. We have no idea why they're getting it. They don't seem to meet any of those risk factors. Having said that, um, the more risk factors you have, the more likely you're going to get benign position vertigo, of course, and also that the prevalence is much greater in the older population. So in fact, where I've got their idiopathic the female to male ratio is 2 point, say two women to, to every male. In fact, when we look at the older population, it's almost equal, men and women. That ending in the older population, they are often a little bit more tricky to get a definite history out of. They might not describe their vertigo as a, as a rotational or a spinning sensation, they might actually just keep thinking, no, this is just giddiness, this is just my old age. And so my general rule of thumb is all older people who talk about dizziness or giddiness or imbalance when they're moving around um, and or have fallen should really be screened for benign positional vertigo. They might have actually stopped doing the provocative movement. They might be lying. Uh, in bed for the last five years with their heads up on three or four pillows. So they're not actually getting into the provocative position. So this is um, the gold standard of testing for benign positional vertigo and it's the dix Holpike maneuver. And as David has said, what we're looking for here is a report of room spinning as well as nystagmus, which is consistent with um, a peripheral nystagmus in benign position vertigo crystals in the wrong bit of the inner ear. So 
Dick's Hall pipe position I now do with, instead of having the head over the edge of the bed like that, I actually have a pillow at the base of the person's spine so that when you rotate the person uh, 45 degrees towards the ear that you're testing, so in this situation 45 degrees to the right, we're testing the right semi semicircular posterior canal here. And then when you lie the person back, you've actually moved that person's head through the plane of the, that movement is going to the same plane as the posterior semicircular canal. So then you've moved fluid. If there are any crystals loose in the inner ear, they will just follow gravity uh, and fall down into that posterior semicircular canal. You often have a tiny latency uh, before you actually see the nystagmus, one or two seconds, maybe five seconds, occasionally a lot longer than that. And then you will see um, that characteristic up, up beating and slightly torsional towards the dependent ear. And when it will last less than 60 seconds in typical sort of benign positional vertigo where the crystals are freely floating in the inner ear. If I had a positive head um, uh, test for, for um, benign positional vertigo, I would not sit the person back up. I would go straight into a treatment. But if you were to sit that person back up, the crystals would blow back the other way and you'd get a reversal of the nystagmus, so a downbeating with a torsional component. And if you did want to torture the patient and keep repeating the Dix Hall pipe test without uh, treating it, then you'll habituate and you'll get fatiguing nystagmus and hopefully the symptoms as well. But that's not what we do. This is, um, hopefully will work. This is actually some film taken off the Omniax machine, which I'll talk about. Um, where, and this is really just to show you the different types of nystagmus that you'll see. Not all nystagmus is very clear. Obviously, you can get different types of delays before the onset. You can get different sort of vigorous uh, type of beating. But you can see with all of these different patients, they've all got this upbeat component to the nystagmus as well as that torsional. And it'll be torsional towards the dependent ear or the ear that you're testing. Um, we would then go ahead and treat this, not sit them up. In this situation, we've got a left posterior semicircular canal canalithiasis, so freely floating uh, otoconia in the semicircular canal. And in this situation, we've got a Dick's whole pipe test to the left. And then we've kept that person with the head dependent. This is a fairly quick video. I tend to keep uh, each position without moving to the next one for about 60 seconds because we want to make sure that gravity has had time to act to move all the crystals down towards the most dependent part of the semicircular canal before you roll the person through to the next one. Otherwise, you might be leaving some of those crystals behind and they might go somewhere else where you don't want them to go. It'll still be benign, but it'll be more complicated. So here we are, this is the second position. Those crystals have moved through a little bit further along the canal. This is the third position. The nose is tucked down into the shoulder on the opposite side. And then when they sit up, those crystals have hopefully popped back into the utricle where they belong. This is the that little video sort of diagram. Uh, it was an Epley maneuver, which is the most commonly used maneuver here, but the picture on the diagram down here is of a Samant maneuver, and that's it for exactly the same condition. Sometimes you can do that a little bit more vigorously if the crystals are actually adhered or stuck to the cupula. So basically all that uh, uh, treatment does it's a mechanical problem. We're just using gravity to move the crystals back to where they belong. And so we call those canalith repositioning maneuvers. It can be a Samant, it can be an Epley, we can use different maneuvers on the Omniax machine. Brant Daroff exercises, although they can still be useful, is technically not a repositioning maneuver because we're moving to both sides without really keeping the head and going through a rotation and having the head below the horizontal. Um, However, people do improve um, with, if they're given brand Daroff exercises, but it tends to take a lot longer. So we can um, treat somebody with a, with a Samant or an Epley within one or two treatment sessions. Brandt Daroff, when they've looked at it in various studies, 
takes a lot longer than that. And what we're looking at here is people adhere to a program of doing five sets of Brent Darroff exercises three times a day. So that's making someone feel indigenous three times a day. Um, and it will work with within sort of three to 14 days. I think the average was something like 10 days. Note that the recurrent rates, recurrence rate for benign positional vertigo can be as high as 50%. So a lot of people do become recurrent um, over the next few years. So it's really important to educate people as to what it is and that it's highly treatable and to treat any kind of predisposing factors um, like low vitamin D levels with supplements, or if they've got poor balance and they're falling over to do some balance exercises. And the types of people um, that do well are people that we can actually maneuver on the bed. So they've got no limitations in terms of neck and spine movements. There are other issues that can uh, make things a little bit more complex, still benign, but more complex, such as having benign position vertigo in both ears, which might happen after trauma. If you've fallen, you can knock um, crystals loose in both, on both sides of the head, or they can go into somewhere other than the posterior canal, remembering that there are three canals in each inner ear. Um, things like hypertension and anxiety don't really affect the, the um, outcome of benign positional vertigo itself unless with cervical issue you can't get your head into the right position um, but they people do often feel like it affects them for a lot longer and they can lose confidence um, in Sorry, terms just, of age, just, just on that Abrindi somebody has asked yeah. is there a relationship between BPPV symptoms getting worse um, during menstrual periods is it can it be related to menstrual cycles or can it get worse? Um, I often think that they might have actually a migraine component to that. So David might want to talk about that mm, as yeah, well. Yeah. But um, benign, and look also, they if you have benign positional vertigo and you're having hormonal changes as well, then yes, definitely that can make you feel it more so it will have more a symptomatic effect but yeah. in terms of actual benign positional vertigo I don't know that there's such a strong relationship there but there mm. is a relationship Thanks. with migraine <laughs> yeah definitely yeah um, thank you all right. no worries sometimes People will rarely, I think when we uh, did a little sort of look at a number of patients that we had in the clinic, I think a very small proportion of people after a, benign, um, a treatment for BPPV had this kind of um, quite disturbing, sort of like a drop attack, like a Tomartin's attack. It's really in a very small minority of people and not every time we've treated them. Um, and it can be a bit of a shock to both the patient and the therapist. And we do get people to sit still for at least five, 10 minutes after a treatment and wait in the waiting room if I'm able to. Some people, particularly older people or people who've got comorbidities such as migraine or other things that affect their balance will feel a little bit more giddy um, after a treatment. That is not necessarily an indication that the treatment has not worked. Um, but some people do for the first 24, 48 hours feel a little bit more woozy, but not necessarily vertigo. If they are still getting vertigo with positional changes, then yes, we need to do another um, assessment and treatment. But if it's giddiness, dizziness, I usually say to them, wait 24 or 48 hours and see how things pan out. Um, and if it's definitely, we can always look at that again. But sometimes that's just a, a, a balance feature, particularly in older people. Again, um, education, explaining to people what has happened and why they feel the way they feel often helps um, reduce that anxiety and improve confidence. And they know that it's treatable, so they can always come back. So this is the Omniax machine. I think that's David in the Omniax machine on pause. Um, and we tend to try and treat people on the bed as a as a first choice, but 
This is really, really helpful for people who have any typically sort of musk issues at all, musculoskeletal issues. So if we can't, if they've got really restricted neck movement um, or they've, they've got problems with the lumbar spine and we can't get them to roll over or even to lie flat on the backs, then this chair is fabulous because all that is, you just have to sit still in the chair. We strap you in really tightly. We stick a camera on people's eyes so we can record the eye movements. And then the only thing the patient has to do is keep their eyes open so that we can see the nystagmus and they can tell us whether or not they feel vertigo with that nystagmus. Um, it's also useful for people that we just have not been able to treat successfully on the bed. So if I've given, given someone a go for three or four treatments and it's still bouncing back, I will refer to the Omniax machine and have a look there. And it's usually treated um, really successfully there or multi-canal benign positional vertigo. So um, in the posterior canal and somewhere else the horizontal, for instance. So this is what it looks like to be treated on the Omniax machine. And here we're looking at a backward somersault. We can't do this on the bed, but we like doing this in the chair because we're, and it follows the canal. So this is, well, I can't see it in the screen, but I think it was a left uh, posterior canal. And you can see the nystagmus there. So the person is not lying there quietly saying hum to do. They're complaining that they can see the whole room spinning around, even though they're in the dark. They will feel that vertigo. So here we go. It's gone for about 20 or so seconds. I think we've sped up this uh, video because normally I would pause here for a little bit longer. And then we're just going to move through. This person's now going through his upside down position to the second part. And we'll just wait here, pause here for another second. Let those crystals low down the semicircular canal as far as they'll go and then as we sit up in the final position and you can see here on the right hand side of the screen you can see what the head's doing and what the uh, chair is doing and then in the colorful things there that's just um, a diagram of where a theoretical sort of positioning of those semicircular canals so we've treated that left dependent pink canal there. All right, so moving along, that was benign positional vertigo really, and um, recall that that is a mechanical problem with otoconia, calcium um, carbonate crystals in the wrong part of the inner ear, causing brief, um, very positionally triggered um, symptoms of vertigo but there are a lot of other causes of vertigo or dizziness and giddiness. Vestibular neuritis, migraine we've already touched on, there are autoimmune diseases that can affect the inner ear, certainly central issues in the brainstem or the cerebellum. Um, you can have bilateral um, hypofunction because of viral issues. Um, acoustic neuroma is really another form of uni unilateral um, hypofunction. You can get this bilaterally as well. And the first thing that people will talk about as their primary symptoms that will really affect them is dizziness, which in the first instance, particularly for a viral type of cause, um, will come on completely unprovoked, but be a lot worse with movement and will last a good 24 or so hours. So this is not seconds or a minute or two. This is going on for hours and they will gradually improve over time, particularly if they're given um, some sort of uh, steroidal anti-inflammatory. They will talk about blurred vision with movement and they may get nausea or vomiting. And obviously, if you can't keep your eyes still in your head, you're going to feel very unsteady, particularly if um, you can't use stable vision as a guide for where you are in space. So busy areas or dark areas. If people are working really hard to keep their balance or keep their eyes stable in their heads when they're moving their heads around, they're going to be fatigued. They're going to have problems with um, memory and concentration. If they have not already got anxiety or depression, they may very well develop anxiety and or depression and get frustrated with things that they can't do. Some people go on and really um, have reduced confidence and really sort of tie themselves up and lie down and wait for things to get better. 
and in terms of function, this obviously has an enormous impact. We, every waking minute of our lives where you're moving your head around, you really need to keep your eyes stable in the head so that that reflex that um, Nicola and David were talking about of equal and opposite eye movement to head movement in order to keep what you're looking at still on the retina and therefore still in the brain. So this will affect things like work, um, even getting to work, walking to the tram or the train or cycling, moving, self-care, lifting your head up to, to wash your hair or work in the garden, bending down to tie your shoelaces. Um, some people will have an increased risk of falls, particularly older people. This will reduce their independence. Some people are too scared to go out because they're feeling, they, they feel that they really need to be in their own familiar environments. And then they might go on and just avoid doing things. And that will um, possibly bring on further problems with neck and shoulder pain and issues reduce fitness, endurance, and then reduce confidence, and then you get into this nasty cycle. And really what vestibular rehabilitation does is encourage that central adaptation of the vestibular system so that those changes that happen in the brain stem and the cerebellum that uh, basically recalibrate the system and produce a long-term change in how the vestibular system with in peripheral parts as well as the central part re respond to head movement and start to recalibrate so that you regain that gaze stability, that coordination of head movement with eye movement um, and postural stability. And we give exercises to try and promote this central compensation. We can't do anything for the inner ear itself. We're really working with the brain and, um, and central plasticity and neuroplasticity. So the people who are most uh, appropriately referred are basically the people with movement provoked symptoms, hopefully due to a stable unilateral and peripheral vestibular lesion. So your classic neuritis after removal of acoustic neuroma, that sort of person is ideal. People who have problems with balance and have problems with movement with, with daily living. But really we will, um, I will basically try and um, help people with vestibular rehabilitation for any of the causes that we've talked about before. It's just that those people with a stable and unilateral problem will respond best in the least amount of time, whereas other people might require longer or possibly all we're doing is educating, trying to take the anxiety and fear out of movement and allow them to get back to some sort of um, normal function or at least some sort of um, facility to self-manage. And so the way we do vestibular rehabilitation these days is a very tailored um, program of exercises um, that's tailored for the individual. Cawthorn and Cooksey exercises um, do have their place. They're a very old set of exercises that date from the um, 1940s after the Second World War. Hawthorne and Cooksey were a physician and a, a physiotherapist in the UK who started seeing thousands, hundreds and thousands of returned soldiers, all with these sort of giddy, dizzy problems. And so this uh, set of exercises were really generic and they're really sort of um, developed for groups of people. And apparently in the UK, they sometimes still do this in halls where you get a whole bunch of people coming in and doing exactly the same exercise. Um, and really vestibular rehab is based on that, but we just tailor it much more for an individual with their individual problems and their individual goals. So as we've all talked about, really, we talk about um, a history of their condition. I tend to also look at their past medical history or even current medical history, particularly if they've got any joint replacements, arthritis, any other conditions that will affect any of their other sensory systems, as well as psychological flags. Do they seem anxious? Have they, got, have they had panic attacks or anxiety in the past? Um, and I will do an objective measure of their head impulse test 
tests. So there's a manual version of the test that Nicola described before, as well as the static and dynamic balance, where I'm targeting the vestibular system. So I'm really kind of challenging that by asking them to stand with their eyes closed or maybe move their heads while they're standing with their feet in a funny position. DHP is a dix hall pipe test. Um, and walking gait, um, looking at what happens with their gait if you ask them to move their head side to side or up and down while they walk. Um, the dizziness handicap inventory is really just a nice indication to me as to what their self-perceived um, effect is of their dizziness or vertigo on their own um, uh, function and um, ability to sort of do their normal everyday things. Education and counselling and explaining why they feel dizzy, whether that's benign position vertigo or neuritis or what the effect of an acoustic neuroma is on their balance system is really um, kind of paramount in trying to um, rehabilitate anyone with exercises because really what I'm doing is getting them to um, stir up a little bit of their dizziness. And we work on basically all parts of the balance system. So eye, ear, head, but also um, a little bit of strength and a little bit of movement. So habituation exercises are actually movements that cause a little bit of their dizziness, which they repeat. And it's sort of, it's graded exposure. It's really based on um, the psychological sort of principles of um, teaching people to overcome or deal with um, things that they've been avoiding. So this is the classic one where we're um, just asking someone to turn themselves around. And really, the symptoms should not be too great. They can't make somebody fall over or throw up or vomit. And it should reduce within a reasonable amount of time. I can't send people home with exercises that are going to make them feel awful for the rest of the day. But as they repeat these, then the symptoms actually reduce. And then they'll hopefully be able to move a little bit more easily and I can progress the exercises. Gaze stability training is, is, is sort of the number one exercise for a hypo function such as with a neuritis or an acoustic neuroma and there again what we're trying to do is recalibrate the system so as to improve that coordination or that synchronicity of eye movement to head movement in an equal and opposite direction at the same speed so that the eyes always stay completely coordinated with head and what you're looking at stays stable and still. Again, balance and gait retraining, but really trying to target the vestibular system, so challenging that with, a, with an uneven surface or additional head movements or eyes closed. The people who do best really are the people who we get to see early, so within the first two, three weeks, a month, um, generally do a little bit better. And also people who actually adhere to the exercise program. So um, I can give people exercises to do, but if they don't do them in the same way as they take medication, I'm not going to expect change. Length of program is so variable between people. Vestibular suppressants, as David was saying before, try and discourage people from taking stematil um, or diazepam or those sorts of things. Um, some people need to, to do the exercises, but really what we're trying to do is wean them off. Age, I have asterisks there because it doesn't really have a big impact on the actual outcomes. A lot of older people do really well with vestibular rehab, and sometimes it's just because they've got time to do the exercises and they don't have to run around looking after children or rush to a job. They can actually focus on themselves a little bit. But the red flags for me are anxiety or depression, and sometimes they may need actual uh, uh, separate psychology input to help deal with that and or comorbidities that affect their other systems. Um, so I talk, often talk about joint replacements or RA, but just memory or problems with vision or a peripheral neuropathy because of diabetes, for instance. Also consider people with those sorts of multi-system um, uh, effects, such as with diabetes, um, or older people who've really developed a huge fear of falling, strength and balance groups or uh, falls prevention groups in often in public community rehabilitation centers can be really, really helpful for these people. And they're usually multidisciplinary. So then you can get psychology input as well as OT to help with um, aids or equipment around the home. And that is just about it, but I will leave you with this.
Thank you so much, Arimbi. We have gone way over time. Yes, uh, my not. fault. Yes, I was I was supposed to time manage, and I did a terrible job as per usual. Um, but I didn't want to cut you off because I thought it was actually very interesting um, and important information. So thank you so much for that. I guess we'll just iterate there this last slide in terms of referring to our balance disorders and ataxia service that um, you can use the iron here a referral form if you want to but it's okay just to use your own normal referral template or letters as long as you address the referral letter to dear neurologist um, and make sure that it is Medicare um, compliant because it is a Medicare funded clinic. I think um, waiting times aren't too bad for a public hospital outpatient clinic um, but it's is probably still around the sort of six week mark, would you say? Does anyone have any idea? Yes, David's nodding his head. So, yeah, so most patients we can get in within six weeks. Um, if there's concern around falls or uh, poorly compensating um, vestibulopathy, then we can get people in within a couple of weeks. Awesome, yeah. Um, I certainly um, use the vestibular physiotherapy who's very well located next door to my clinic. Um, it's, it's costly, but I, I'm fortunate enough to work in an area where patients um, are happy to pay the price and it, it really does help just lock in that diagnosis when I can't see the torsion or nystagmus doing the whole pipe manoeuvre. Um, and certainly, um, yeah, is a great help. So we will include all of that sort of information in the handout. There is one more question, um, if you just indulge us, uh, with a quick question on if you try the Epley manoeuvre on the wrong side or in the wrong direction, could you make things work? No, you just won't help. <laughs> and then no, you it just won't make it better. Yeah. That's, and then you it just, won't, just won't make it better. But you're, you're not going to hurt them. Okay, awesome. Um, Okay, I think there weren't any more questions. So really, I'm um, thank you to you guys for presenting. Evaluation forms will be, a link will be emailed to participants um, at the close of this uh, webinar. Thank you so much for all of you who hung in there um, and gave up so much time tonight, not just our speakers, but the attendees. <laughs> um, there, there will be a video recording uh, available. I'll email my emailing list when that's available uh, to uh, watch from our website. Um, what else do I need to tell you? If you want to, if you're not already on my emailing list, then please sign up at gpliaison at ionia.org.au. Um, uh, our next GP education webinar is on the 2nd of December and we'll be covering an approach to diplopia by Dr. Rahul Chakrabarti. Um, registrations are open, so if you go to the Northwest Melbourne PHN website and look at their events uh, program, you can sign up to that right now. Uh, thank you so much to the team from our Balance Disorders and Ataxia Service, Dr. David Smulovic, Arimbi Winoda and Nic Nicola Baker um, for your fabulous presentations. Thank you, Madeline Leonard from Northwest Melbourne PHN for all of your support uh, with this webinar, but also for your ongoing support of our GP education program. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended. I think that's it for me. Any final comments from anybody else? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you I think we're complete there. Thank you.